It's very important to uh, respect and honor those who unjustly feel their life being taken away because we is universal. That life is sacred. It's a something that is very sacred to anybody, any community, any human being. If there is something say in our religion saying that if you kill one person, you kill every human person in the, on the earth. And if you help a life, you help every life in the universe. So it's very important to not let it forget and, and forget those people who their lives is being taken unjustly. Hi, my name is Muhammad Akor. I am uh, the president and CEO of the Alusa Institute. It's a non-profit organization based on Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. The organization's main uh, activity is uh, community capacity building and grassroots mobilization. What caused our young men become vulnerable to such a, a, a violence or potential violence? Because it's not only one who lost their life, there is a, many of them are who are potential for that lifestyle. Is a, is, is a lack of opportunity, racism, discrimination, marginalization, and above all, there is no support in any shape or of, of form from their government. The family was informed that their loved one was killed, communicating with them, giving them update, let them know where the case stands and where it is stuck, and also the next thing they will like to have it is the support from the law enforcement. You know, when you are advocating and you have no skills because there is no uh, a, a map or anything to develop, one of the things that uh, what we realize immediately is that you need allies. And allies, because the challenge is, is when you go there as a, as a black person, as an immigrant, is what happened is that your voice is, is not, be, you're not gonna have a sympathy or, or you're not gonna have a, a, a strong voice, which means that they will only tell them, okay, this is Somalis, even they've been separated from us, from African uh, community. So then we look around and look at for allies. And the first person I ever met was uh, René Bourgeois, who was the uh, executive uh, director of uh, John Humphrey uh, Center, Peace and Human Rights, who we would partner with and develop an organization called uh, Coalition for Justice and Human Rights. My name is René Bourgeois, and I am with the John Humphrey Center for Peace and Human Rights. Mohammed actually had come to me because he had been suggested to come visit me as a resource to learn about what he needed to do to strengthen his advocacy. Um, he was uh, trying to figure out like how to be an advocate um, but yet you know still earn revenue <laughs> in doing that advocacy work so we started we, we, we had a good relationship and we just started um, regularly connecting and talking about our advocacy um, and you know he was hitting a lot of barriers in his advocacy and the work that he was seeing so we kind of became a place where we were bouncing off each other exploring ways that we could take the issues forward in different ways um, and so we really started emerging I think it was about 2012-2013 one of the things he was really actively noticing and well one of the big issues in the community was around particularly men in, in the Somali community and the barriers that they were facing, young men. Uh, you know, they were hitting the barriers in the schools, you know, the prison to the pipeline kind of approach. Um, 
also facing a lot of barriers in accessing employment, uh, just facing you know non-stop policing, racial profiling by police and stops. And there were so many layers in that. And then we started looking at the justice system and within the jails and within the remand center. And we were started to work on cases together, uh, specific cases. And we were also doing a lot of like meetings with community to identify, yes, these are the issues, but what are the families needing from this? In terms of the education system, there were so many barriers there in terms of the way, um, you know, young people were being pushed in the education uh, and, we tried to build bridges with Edmonton Public Schools, with the superintendent and that, trying to kind of push the conversations, help them to understand the racism that was just naturally unconscious within the education system for these young men. Through that journey, we started coming together. We started the Coalition for Justice and Human Rights together, which was to be an organization for folks like Muhammad and I who, you know, people who could come together and start doing the systemic advocacy work stronger together with other folks who are leaders of other nonprofit organizations and that. So Muhammad and I have a pretty long history. Um, I see him as a very close friend of mine and there's just one moment with Muhammad that I always think of that makes me smile. Um, you know, one time he said to me, Renee, you keep the door open and I'll keep banging the drums. And I think that says so much about our relationship. I'm like the you know, navigator kind of opening the doors and getting us into spaces and he's the one that'll come in and crash, crash the party. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So when, when we, when we trying to, um, uh, when we trying to advocate, there are three layer, uh, police, police commission and the city, and, and later on to the province. The bullet, we, we, when we have to speak with the police, we couldn't go, we, go, we, couldn't, we didn't go nowhere with them because they will come to you with a big notebook, you will give them what is needed to be fixed and you never hear from them. So that was the first relation first. The second thing happened was we, we, we engaged with the police commission and that time, there's only one, uh, there were uh, some uh, uh, Indian, Canadian, but also there is the only one black guy, a black uh, Canadian. Uh, uh, his name is, was Kelly uh, Tomaklo. My name is Chief Nyahu Tomaklo VI, formerly known as Kelly Tomaklo. I have known Mohammed Accord for over 10 years. I got to know Mohammed when I became a board director of the Council for the Advancement of African Canadians, known as the Africa Center. Mohammed was then a president of one of the Somali associations. He was a strong advocate for Somali issues. He was, a, he was highly respected and revered by all levels of government in Canada. Together with Mohammed, and other black progressive leaders, we decided to put at the forefront visible minority issues, especially the unfair treatment of Somalis. But our message is we are a one family, one community. We have difficulties, we have problems. We need to address this issue, how we can reach our goal. That is where I am coming from. My name is Ahmed Ali. I am the Director of Social Injustice and Education Inequality Association. Uh, my community, they are a part of the other communities who are living in here. But at the same time, we are, you see, the visible minority. At that time, since we are the visible minority, the rules and regulations that's supposed to protect, you see, for the visible minority, or as a Canadians, was a little bit, you know, harsh to us as a community. At that time, we came out as the educated people, you know, who have a knowledge and who have experience for how the government works. At that time, that advocacy is not a negativity that we are, you know, fighting with the government, but our advocacy is to build the bridge, how we get a better service from the government and we become a better citizens 
in their country. The issues of unsolved homicides in this city, in this province, in this country, um, are not just relevant to the Somali community at all. I mean, if we wonder why we have missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two spirits, it all leads back to this legacy of criminalization and genocide. We, as a recently arrived community in Canada, have similar issue and pain and suffering with Indigenous people. They have been suffering these cases for far too long, and they're still suffering. They have a missing and murdered people, the same thing that we have. So they share with us their experience with the Canadian system. So for us, we're learning from them, their experience, at the same time, we are, we are sharing and we are uh, supporting each other in order to, to face uh, this faceless injustice. At the same time, we're thinking that our commonality will strengthen our resolve. My name is William Cardinal Maurer. Um, I am relatives to uh, Jacob Sansom. He's my cousin and Morris Cardinal, he's my uncle. Um, they were uh, brutally gunned down by the side of the road in Glendon, Alberta, uh, March 27th, 2020. The farmers who killed them uh, were able to plead not guilty um, and then take it to trial basically, even though um, you know, there was evidence against them. It's, you know, it's a, it's a colonial court system, so anything could happen. They, they, could, they could walk as well. And so I feel like in some degree we'll get justice, but in another degree there's always that fear as an Indigenous person that we might not. For a long period, we were looking for a solution from the law, uh, law enforcement from the city from the province and as well as the federal government. Our plight wasn't secret. It was known to the throughout the world. So the community never have a chance, was never given chance, come together and first of all, talk about their issue by themselves. So this is the first time we say that, wait a minute, why don't we come together first and talk about what we are facing as a community and also sh ask the other community to share with us who have a similar issue, uh, for example, indigenous. So we're going to have a, a, a town hall meeting where we invited other community, whether it's a, 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 co a Korean, Canadian, Chinese, Canadian, Vietnam, Canadian, uh, indigenous and others to tell us, to share us their story, because every community who came into the Canada faced the similarity. To, to share in that pain and to share in that grief, um, uh, it's, I, it's, like a, it's almost like a collective trauma, and, and to share each other's pain is, is, is really important um, on, on, like, you know, on, on the pathway to healing. And, um, and obviously stronger together, you know, like if each racialized community showed up and stood together, like, um, you know, we'd be unstoppable. Here to share their perspectives on the issues with us and to open up the conversation. So this is a dialogue, it's a conversation. Uh, the idea is for it to be thought provoking. The idea is to get you to think and speak. So we don't want you to just think of something and hold it in. Uh, you have to share it as well. Our request is that we must, in order to keep uh, to give space for everyone, keep the comments one to two minutes, so we can continue the conversation and ensure that we all benefit from it.
Oh well, yeah, uh, my name is yeah, Will, Will Mauer, William Mauer. Um, I, I work for the Bissell Center here in the city. I do street outreach um, for the Bissell Center. I've worked with um, Edmonton's homeless population. Uh, my role at the town hall was uh, to share uh, Jacob and Morris's story. The, the day after the town hall, the, the, my family's murder trial was, was starting. Um, and so it was very fresh on my mind and uh, my uncle Lloyd uh, asked me to speak and, and share my story. And, um, and, and my takeaway was, like I had seen a post on Instagram about the town hall like maybe a week before. Like unheard of, you know, like I read that and, uh, and I, couldn't, I couldn't help but think about like indigenous people, you know. And like when my cousin and uncle were murdered, it barely broke local news, you know. And, uh, and when they were murdered, you know, when, when indigenous people get murdered, when, when people of color get murdered, you know, the people will ask, oh, what were they doing? You know, why were they there? There must be two sides to the story. You know what I mean? Like, um, we have to fight to like humanize them in the eyes of like majority culture, right? So, <clears throat> so I'm a, a criminal defense lawyer primarily. I've, I've been a lawyer for 40 years going on 41. Um, I'm, I'm the chair of the uh, Criminal Trial Lawyers Association Policing Committee. And so what we do with that is that we, we try to improve oversight of the police. So our, our primary goal is to try to assist, advocate, so that we have the best policing possible. The other thing I do is uh, I'm, I'm also the uh, president of the, of the uh, Canadian Prison Law Association. And in that regard, I deal a lot with the systemic racism that we find in our prisons, in Alberta, uh, federal and provincial, and across the country. Every week we used to see about five or six youth from the Somali community dying. And I'm sure our indigenous people also have been having those kind of issues as well, and I feel sorry for them as well. And so it came to a level where my colleagues at work came to me and said, what's happening in the community? That's how I get involved. The question also is question of justice in terms of uh, people who are going to jail is also another issue. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of uh, people from the black community and also our indigenous people also make up the largest when it comes to uh, our justice systems and so on. So, there's a systemic issues, whether it is uh, from the you know, all level of government, not dealing with the issue itself. At that time, in the town hall meeting, it was giving us a relief that when the issue came to the floor, the police were there, the criminal lawyers were there, you see the communities are there, indigenous people who are suffered in the system also was there. At that time we felt that, you see, that it is giving us a relief that our issue today become on the floor. At that time the accountability comes from at the top. They must be at the top to be accountable, then the bottom will be accountable. That is one of the problems we minority we face, whether you are an indigenous, whether you are an Asian, whether you are a black. It is a problem that we cannot be solved until we find someone who's respecting the constitution and the rule of law. Today we don't have that. Well, in the end, it's, uh, it's again, it's been two years that we've waited for this to happen. And it's a two years of not knowing uh, what the outcome is going to be. Like, we know these men killed our family, and uh, we know there's evidence that backs it up. But at the same time, right, this, the courts, you know, settlers can play the thieving Indian card. And who knows, maybe they'll get off. And so um, to sit in the courtroom and, you know, there's a video of, of the murder. Um, and it was, it's been made public, it's been posted. There was a, a video camera on a building in the intersection they were killed at that caught everything. And so we get to sit in court and, you know, Sarah Jacobs, 
uh, Jacob's wife gets to sit there as they replay this video over and over again and Ruby uh, Morris's sister and Jacob's mom gets to sit there and watch her son and her brother uh, die over and over again and 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 just to hear them talk about Jacob and Morris and they they don't even know who they were um, they, they've never even met them before you know they don't know their character they don't know the love they gave um, they don't know the joy they brought and so to sit there and watch them slander and and and, and speculate about men they had no idea of um, just is extremely painful and it's extremely re-traumatizing just having to go through that every single day um, for the past two weeks basically. My role was one of uh, advocacy. I joined the Africa Center and worked with other black leaders to highlight the case of the Somalis. At the forefront were many black leaders, for example, Dawit Tesfai, Mohammed Hassan, and uh, Jibril. As a police commissioner, I requested from the Edmonton Police Commission monthly demographics of homicides broken down by race. I also requested specific clearances for each homicide. I was able to make sense of any discrepancies. At meetings between the Edmonton Police Commission and the Edmonton City Council, I made sure that the Somali issue was always at the forefront. If the justice becomes sick, it is equivalent like the medicine. When you become sick, you need a medicine. If the medicine becomes sick, where you will go? You have no way to go, nothing. You will die. At that time, today, the justice system needs a reform. The police needs a reform but nobody listens. That it means the justice becomes sick and it needs a help. That is why every day we are advocating, please work for the, you see, the coming generations. We can suffer today, but we don't want our children to suffer. At that time, we need a justice that can work for the society, not for us only. Because today, justice, the one that is existing in Alberta, the one that is existing federally, it is totally, it is an injustice, not justice. At that time, that's why we advocate daily to get. At that time, in terms of hope, hope, yes, we have a lot of people in the political, you see, group, in the advocacy group, in the religious society and faith groups, in the mothers and fathers and all, they all fighting, you see. And that time, what we see today is, the hope is coming. We see the hope. But when the hope is coming, we don't know. I just want to say on behalf of the Samson and Cardinal families, we just want to thank the jury, Judge Macklin, the Crown Prosecutors, Mr. Rudiak and Mr. Kerr, and their wonderful team for all of the work they've done to bring justice for the senseless murders of Morris and Jake. We'd also like to thank the RCMP Major Crimes Unit and the local Bonneville Police. Uh, the family would also like to thank William Cardinal Mauer for his loving support. <laughs> his loving support, his wonderful community of friends for all the meals that they've provided for the family over the last three weeks. Like in the end, like I'm very thankful the trial's over and like, you know, we don't have to worry about them getting out at least for a little bit. Um, but yeah, we wish we wish the, the sentencing was a bit part more harsh or harder on them. Um, and we're still waiting to see how long they will be sentenced and then that could also be like some more 
BS, but yeah, so no, I don't, yeah. We're happy it's done with, but yeah, we're still not, we're still not satisfied, I don't think. Justice is when everybody feels that every homicide is being solved without any perceived bias. Justice is when the Somalis feel that their homicide is being taken seriously and being solved. What, what family and the loved one of the victims need is support. That's the biggest. Ac at least the acknowledgement of their loss. There will be always a hole in their heart and the empty chair in their houses. So they will never be, we cannot replace them, what they have lost. But one thing that really, really helped them was getting them some support of knowing what happened to their loved one. How did they die? Who killed them? Uh, where the uh, process is? What is missing? Um, if there is any information that they can provide, all those one thing will help. Above all, is respecting them. The, what could also help them was that bringing those who are responsible for the death of their loved one into the justice. That's what will help them.